So let's start. Just um, so this is the adding more Puerto Rican culture and identity to your games talk. Um, I don't anticipate this talk to be super long. It's probably going to be about uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more if I decide to keep talking because I do talk a lot. Um, but pretty much what I really wanted to touch on was ways in which you can embed a piece of who you are and where you're from in the games that you're making and how that sets you apart from all the games in the market and especially in Global Game Jam when there are hundreds and maybe perhaps even thousands of games being submitted to the site and people have the ability from all over the world to play your game and read about it. So how do you stand out from the rest of the crowd? How do you offer something new to the table that is interesting that other people have never seen before? And to be able to do that, the easiest way is to embed a little piece of you by adding your own culture, your own identity and your own life experiences as specifically here because we're talking about the Puerto Rican game jam, about being Puerto Rican, what it's like to live on uh, in Puerto Rico, to have the culture that we have, the traditions and the values that we have. Um, those are our own and how we can share that on a global scale with games is something very special. And that's pretty much what I wanted to share today. So in my first slides, you can see that I have a title. I tried to embed some icons in there that have, were of Puerto Rican uh, identity. So you see the amapola, which is our national flower, and the flag, and the coqui, and the vigimante mask. And those are things from our culture. But as you can see, I didn't really go for the red, white, and and blue type of flavor, which we see often is a big stereotype that in order to make something identified as Puerto Rican, it has to be related to our colors on our flag or it has to say Puerto Rico on it. And that's not necessarily true. So I wanted to give the idea of what I'm talking about when I say embedding culture and identity um, by adding things to not necessarily slapping on the label of Puerto Rico on on the things that you make. So let me continue on with the second slide a little bit about me. So my name's Elaine Gomez. Um, I grew up in Puerto Rico in Bayamón. I lived in Puerto Rico until I was 11, and then we moved to New Jersey when I, when my mom uh, got transferred for her job. So I have been in the United States since um, 2001, which is quite a long time. So I pretty much grew up here, but I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. So I carry a lot of those things with me since they, I was exposed to them at a very early age. Um, I am a professional game designer at an indie studio called Eline Media, and I'm currently working on a game called Beyond Blue, which is an ocean exploration game that is being made in collaboration with BBC, uh, who made the documentary series Blue Planet. And I'm also very proudly co-founder of Latinx in Gaming, which is an organization of, under the IGDA that services the Latin American community, both developers and non-developers. So we're talking about streamers, people in marketing and, um, and PR, uh, esports, anything that has to do with the gaming industry, even including students who are not in the industry yet. Um, we service everyone in Latin America and the Caribbean, both domestically and abroad. So that's a little bit about me and what I'm involved in. So let me continue on with the next slide. I'm going to go slide three. Um, so in slide three, there is a trailer there of Beyond Blue, so you get a taste of kind of like what we're doing with that game and how it looks like. Um, and then the following slide, I have a picture of Latinx and gaming. So this uh, picture was taken at GDC 2018 versus GDC 2019. So for those of you that don't know, GDC is the Game Developers Conference. It happens every year, and it's pretty much the biggest conference that we have for on the professional side in the games industry where we get to meet with our friends and like learn new things that are coming up in the games industry, whether it's design, art, or programming, uh, things that are coming out. And we get to see each other's work and see what's coming next in the games industry. So we started Latinx and Gaming in 2018. And as you can see from the two pictures, we have grown exponentially over the past couple of years. Um, and the picture at the bottom was taken last year. So this coming GDC in March, we're hoping that we're going to have an even bigger group than that, which is really exciting. So following slide. So I have the Global Game Jam slide here. So why are we doing this? Why are we here? Um, Global Game Jam is super special. And I always tell people who want to get into the industry or who want to refine their skill sets in game development to always get involved in a game jam because that's where you really get to pull 
put your skills to the test. So in Global Game Jam, it, since it happens every year and there's a big community around it, there's so many resources that are available for it and to it. So it is awesome and I commend everybody who is going to be uh, uh, participating in the Global Game Jam. I will be doing it as well. I have lots of friends who will be doing it and we're super looking forward to seeing what everybody comes up with and what the theme will be this year. So that brings you to the following slide, which is supposed to be a joke. Um, when I say uh, embedding Puerto Rican culture and identity, I don't mean, again, slapping red, white, and blue everywhere and putting Puerto Rican things all over the place. Like, that's n not what I'm here for. I mean, if you want to do that, go ahead. I, I'm not going to judge you. But um, this talk is not about that. Um, it's, it goes beyond that. It, it goes about the the values that we can transform and we can, and analogies that we can make in, in, game, in game design and game development from music to art um, to game mechanics themselves, how we can create fluid and organic uh, ways in which we can tell stories and also embed culture. And that's really where I'm trying to get at with this talk. So in my following slide here, I have why add culture and identity to a game? Why is that important? Why does that matter? Why are we putting politics, quote unquote, into the games that we make? That's a big question that people always ask me. It's like, why is that important? Why do we need to service um, minorities? Why do we need to have diverse characters in our games and things like that? So those are questions that people have. Um, and all I can say is that adding culture and identity to any project, whether it's a game or whether it's a book, whether it's a movie, any type of media, what you're doing is reaching out to people who don't really have a, a, as big of a voice, unfortunately, right? So um, there's only a few million of us in the world, Puerto Ricans, um, and we have so much stuff going on on our island. And I think that in order to bring awareness, in order to, to, on a global scale, tell people our stories and what's happening to us and how we're resilient and how we are as a people, the most awesomest ways that we can do that is with games. So one of the ways is by standing out, like I said earlier, standing out from the hundreds of games that are gonna be part of the Global Game Jam. And I bet you, and this is not a job to people who would wanna do this, but I bet you that a lot of games are gonna be shooters, a lot of games are gonna have some type of sci-fi element um, because people like that and that's what they're attracted to, which is totally fine. But if that's what everybody is doing, then we see a lot of saturation. And that's what we are seeing in the industry as a whole, that a lot of games are starting to look the same and people are just buying the same things and we want some Something new. We want something fresh. We want a new perspective. We want to experience something that we've never experienced before. And I think that with adding culture and identity into the projects that we make, we have an opportunity to do that. Um, so that goes on to my second point, an opportunity to do something new, to, to explore something that you've never explored before, um, to bring something to the community. So one, an example that I can give you was back in 2015, I joined the Global Game Jam at USC, which is my university at the time, University of Southern California. And I was pursuing my master's in games design there. And the theme that year was ritual. And that was a really difficult theme because a lot of people went super literal literal with it. So they literally did rituals like satanic, like witchcraft rituals. And other people l didn't know what to do, which happened to be me. I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I decided to do something with salsa. So it, was, it wasn't really a game. It was more of an experience, but we put on salsa music and I used um, motion detect sensors because I was working a lot with Arduino and, and processing. And uh, we use uh, these motion sensors and we put them on a speaker and anytime somebody would walk by or move around that motion sensor, the music would play. And pretty much uh, what was cool about that was that I brought salsa into a room that people don't really hear salsa, right? Because it was in California and a lot of my uh, classmates were not. Latinos. So them hearing salsa for the first time or or them hearing it at all in that space to them was like, well, that's really cool. Like I have I, I don't really listen to this unless I'm going to like a Latino restaurant. Um, and I brought that flavor to the room and it created like a different type of environment. It was super lively. People were just watching people dance. And, and even if it was just silly dancing, even if it wasn't salsa at all, it was just funny and 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 really 
really nice to see people engage in different ways with the experience that I made. And it just created something new and fresh that people were not expecting. So that's the type of stuff that you can bring to the table when you decide to use culture and your own identity and you're making your games. And another thing is to be inspired to expand it to a full game. So for some of you may know, some of you don't, but games, for example, like Surgeon Simulator started from a, ga a game jam and it was something funny that he decided to expand. And now it's like a whole genre of simulation games that were birthed from that. You have like Goat Simulator and Truck Simulator that I feel were all came down the line because of Surgeon Simulator. So you really have the opportunity to really make an impact and make something way bigger than you would have thought just because you decided to explore a new idea. So how do we add culture and identity to the games? So I looked over the Global Game Jam Diversifiers list and I tried to pick some that I thought were good additions to, or at least good segues to trying to bring culture and identity. So I'm going to outline those a little bit in the following slides. But I think that is a good place to look first. See what kind of diversifiers Global Game Jam has already provided and see what you can do to stand out and, and embed a little bit of Puerto Ricanness in your game. Another one would be to explore some issues on the island that we all know that we are all super aware of. Um, so I'm going to expand on those a little bit later. And then the third thing would be to focus on something very specific about your game. So whether that is art, an art style, or embedding certain art assets, whether that is choosing instruments specifically that are from Puerto Rico and choosing a, a music genre that will add that, that flair of culture in is another way to do it. Um, do, making a specific mechanic that creates some type of an analogy to the culture or adding Easter eggs. Um, and I have examples of games and projects that I have seen including games that are not made from by Puerto Ricans, but I wanted to give you some examples of how those things may look like inside a game project. So let's look over the some global game jam diversifiers that I thought were pretty cool. So the very first one, uh, and I actually put up the link there as well in the slide so that you can take a look at the list in case you hadn't seen it before. Um, but the first one that I thought would be really good to add a little bit of culture and identity to would be a kind of cooperation. So that diversifier was sponsored by Sony. And it says, I'll read it here in the list, it says that um, you should create a cooperative multiplayer game that encourages collaboration and kindness. So the reason why I thought that would be a good one was because being here in the, the United States, I saw the way that the entire Pueblo came together when uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and even during the protest and um, talking about corruption and the feeling of unity that that the entire country is having against these things and helping each other even in the, during the earthquakes bringing in supplies and resources from different areas of the country that still had those things available and bring them down to people who were in need like that sense of unity is so ingrained in Puerto Rico that it would be beautiful to see that expanded into a game um, and that type of cooperation, that type of kindness that we're here for each other. If if there's a mechanic and a way that we could do that and we can embed that, I think that would be something awesome to explore. Um, the second diversifier that I thought was really cool was the native sound diversifier. So that's under the audio list. And that one's very specific about musical instruments that are specific to the country or region that you're jamming in. So Everybody who's in Puerto Rico, you have access to all of those instrumentations. Maybe audio designers or sound designers out there know where to find those libraries at, or even maybe you even have instruments that you can play and record and then place in the game. I think that's an awesome way to go ahead and embed culture and identity because music is something super special and I think we all connect to it um, at a global scale, no matter what country you're from. M music is so special and it really brings people together um, regardless of what language you speak or where you're from. So I think adding a little bit of a flavor from salsa, merengue, bachata, even, even though it's Dominican Republic, we still have it a little bit on the island, bomba en plena. There's so many things that you can to add to add uh, music wise and audio wise that I think would be special and different than what other people are going to be focusing on. 
The third one that I thought was really interesting was preaching to the choir, which is also an audio diversifier. And this one is to get 10 people to sing and you place that track in your game. So the first thing that I thought of when I read this diversifier was the Bomba and Plena songs that we sing uh, during Christmas time. And I'm not going to sing it because I'm not going to embarrass myself. But we have that call and response and everybody knows them and everybody knows exactly what to do when anybody starts singing it. So I think it would be really cool if somebody decided to do some type of bomba song and just had a call and response going on and recorded it and put it in the game as like their theme song. Um, I think that would be really cool. I would do it if I could, but there's no way that I'm going to get 10 people to sing Boba Plena in the middle of Arizona. I don't think that's going to happen, even though that would be definitely be something that I would be willing to do. So I'm going to go on to the last three diversifiers here. So Eco Action is funny because I'm working on Beyond Blue and it's a game about conserving the ocean. So I thought it was super interesting that one of the diversifiers has to do with ocean conservation as well. So we are an island, right? Puerto Rico is an island and there are so many things that we should worry about with our environment, especially with the earthquake and the hurricane that we the aftermaths of it all are still happening um, and they are affecting our environment and think we're losing things. Um, I recently saw one of our landmarks, um, like a rock formation that toppled down because of the earthquake. Um, and even though that may not do with ocean conservation, it just goes to show you that um, there are natural things that we are losing um, just because of time, right? The erosion, the weather, climate change, et cetera. So if we can make a commentary, I think that would be a really awesome thing as well, making a commentary on saving our ocean, saving specific creatures that are in Puerto Rico, like the coqui, things like that. Um, but the corals, for example, with ocean acidity, there are so many topics that you can think about concerning eco action that have to do with Puerto Rico, just because we are, we have a rainforest, we're a tropical environment, we have, we're surrounded by water, and there's so many living creatures um, that live and inhabit in Puerto Rico and in the Caribbean alone. So there's so many cool things that we can explore there when it comes to the environment. The second um, point on this slide, language independence, this one could be interesting because it speaks to how you can make a game that is universally understood by everybody. So not having dialogue or text in any language. So how can you use icons perhaps to be able to, to tell players what to do? Um, and that's something really interesting um, to think about and something that I personally find fascinating. A good example of that would be in an airport. If you go in an airport anywhere around the world, there's certain icons that people see and they know exactly what it means. So icons are a very good way to do that. So how can you add a little bit of flavor in icons that you use, for example, would be a good way to, to do that. And this last one, pro tip, it doesn't necessarily tie in with culture, really. I just thought that it was a good diversifier to add to any team. Um, everybody should get some sleep, everybody should eat, and you should try not to be sitting down for like 10, 12, 15 hours making a game. It's just not healthy. Uh, and it should be fun um, to make this game to be part of the Global Game Gym. Um, so definitely try your best to be as stable mentally, emotionally, and physically as you can, is you don't want to burn out over the weekend and then continue on with your life on Monday. Um, and I have been through that myself, so I can definitely say it's just not worth it. Don't don't kill yourself over the game jam. Don't overscope. That's like the last thing that you want to do. So those are a list of some diversifiers that I thought would be applicable to culture and identity. Um, and of course, there may be other ones that you may feel would fit better. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check out the, the website and see which ones you think your team would, would be willing to use. And remember that you don't have to pick five, six, or seven. Don't, don't put yourself into that box. Even if you can use one diversifier or two, that is actually a really good goal to have. You don't have to be an overachiever. So let's go on to the next slide here, exploring issues on the island. So like I said before, um, the earthquakes that are even ongoing currently on the island, the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, the protests, the corruption going on uh, on the island, 
the issues that we have a feminicide um, and issues that have to deal with our violence against women. There's so many negative things that we can really turn into positives and into awareness with the games that we make. Um, and I have some examples about some key negative situations that have happened um, in the world where developers have taken those situations that have turned them into really positive um, and impactful game experiences and, and just games in general. So the next slide about focusing on aspects of a game. So like I said before, there are, there are just so many ways that you can add, add a little bit of flavor um, in different disciplines, right? We all often forget that game development is like all encompassing and we have to think about everything um, linearly, but we don't have to at all. If you decide to make it add a little bit of a piece of your culture or, or your experience into your game, you don't have to add it into every single category of the of the game's design. So you don't have to add it in the music and the art and the UI. Like you don't have to do that to yourself. You don't have to box yourself in. But if you choose one aspect of it where you can really allow the culture to shine in a way and you really think is the best place to add culture based on your own game's design, I think that's a smart way and to embedding culture that it's not in your face, but it's subtle and organic. And I think that's the best way really to add cultures to be subtle and organic, but also genuine, right? Cause you don't wanna feel like you're putting like stickers and you're stapling things on that really don't belong there, right? That you're just adding it just because you wanna be very thoughtful and meaningful in the way that you add things into your game. So like I said, with art, um, the easiest way is the environment. So what are some plants? What are some trees that are native to Puerto Rico? Can you find those models on Turbo Squid or some other uh, 3D modeling library that you can download and put in your game? Um, is there a 3D artist that's going to be part of your team? And is it feasible for them to, cr to quickly create um, art that goes along with those types of things, those those sketches and those concepts that you had. With music, the same way that I explained before, um, using instrumentation and finding it to um, bring in some cultural flavor, whether that is in like sound effects when your characters or, or, or different creatures or whatever it is in your game when they move around or when they attack or when they interact with you, that could be a way of doing it. It could be with a the musical theme of the game. Um, and it could just be not even in the game itself. Maybe it's just part of like the start screen or the ending credits. Um, so you can be very strategic in the way that you want to add it. Um, game mechanics is a really interesting one as well as puzzle design because it really is dependent on your own game's design. Um, but let's say you choose, um, hypothetically, let's say I chose to make a game where I am, uh, I don't know, a little girl who's trying to collect friends to go to a protest, right? And our goal is to go from my house to San Juan. Let's say that that's the game. So what are the game mechanics that I can do to foster kindness, to foster unity, to foster banding together? Um, and the way that you concept those mechanics and flow is the way that you can tell the story and start to assimilate things into the game. Um, and it can be about anything really um, that's really dependent on your pre-concepting phase and making sure that you're scoping down and can tell your game story and your game's vision on, on something that's core, like, like the core game mechanic of it all uh, or the gameplay flow. With puzzles, it's a little bit harder, um, but they work this in the same way as game mechanics go, right? So you want to make sure that there's meaningfulness and that everything is wrapped out in your in your core game mechanic. Um, I suggest with core game mechanics that you focus on one to three. Don't try to add five, six, seven, because the more core mechanics that you add into your game, the easier they will fall apart because you just do not have the time to play test them and you don't have the time to iterate on them as you would if you had more time. So be very careful in the way that you choose your core game mechanics and that you really allow yourself time to blend them well together so that they make sense. If, if Let's say you're picking two game mechanics that you decide to use. Do they blend together? Does it make sense in the story and the world that you're trying to tell? Um, are they harmonious with each other? Um, and are they 
going along with what you want to say? And are and of course, are they going along with the theme? You're not bound to the theme per se. You don't have to do it. It's optional. But um, I definitely do do encourage you to to stay aligned with the theme um, and try to see what what you can get to with a constraint. And then the last thing here that I had were Easter eggs. So with Easter eggs, they're cool because you can place them anywhere and they don't really necessarily need to belong, quote unquote, but it's a little like surprise that you can give to a player. And if they're also from the same culture or they understand your reference, they feel really good and rewarded when they see that. Um, so let's say you have a 2D platformer game, you end up opening a treasure chest and out of it comes something like a like an empanada right like that would be funny to us right but it's definitely that little touch of like um cultural like surprise that you don't necessarily have to put in the player's face but it's something cute that you can that you can add to bring a laugh or bring about some type of positive emotion from your player right and of course don't let it be completely um, out of the blue, like if you have a game where you are shooting at things and it's all sci-fi and everything looks a certain way and then all of a sudden you have a, a 2D pixelated empanada, that's not going to make any sense. Um, so make sure that you are, um, that you practice good judgment in the way that you are bringing things um, into cohesion when you are designing them. So the following slides are just a few references that I have of those games where I thought they really embedded culture or they or they use some type of situation um, in a positive light. So the very first one, the very first example that I have in my slide deck is what I call protesta craft. Uh, it doesn't have a, a name. It's something that floated on a, around Twitter during the Puerto Rican protests, but somebody decided to construct this like Minecraft um, replica of Viejo San Juan. And they had like little hibaros and they had um, the umbrellas that are in Viejo San Juan, one of the avenues. Um, and they have like a pile of fire with the American flag burning. You don't, you don't have to go that negative, um, but it was amazing to see that somebody decided to do that in, in Minecraft style um, and really make a commentary on the protest and what was going on. So I thought that was a good example of how culture and, I, and identity and something that was going on on the island really transferred into digital space. Uh, a second example that I have here is from a game called Cookie Beat. Cookie Beat is in alpha right now and it's being made by an indie um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, like, I don't know if they're a studio, like if they're an LLC yet, but they are a group of Puerto Rican indie developers in New York City, and they go under the name Star Yolk Studios. And Cookie Beat is uh, a game where they're using the cookie um, and its behavior as a way to traverse space, like in a platformer. So they have the sounds of the cookie um, and being able to, like, uh, climb up walls like a frog and things like that. Um, they're using all of those different characteristics of a cookie and the sounds of it to create their game. And what I thought was really cute and really sweet was that just like in uh, in some 2D platformers where you have a checkpoint, um, the studio, the developers decided that every checkpoint would be marked by a Puerto Rican flag in the style of their game. It's like a 2D uh, kind of 8-bit uh, style game. So it was really sweet that they were able to embed those types of nuances in the game without being super in your face. Um, the music is also very like, not like salsa, but it has a little bit of flair in there because it's a bit of a rhythm game. So to them, audio and, and music was very important, as well as the dialogue, the things that um, are being brought up, but like your guide or your helper in the game, um, words like mija, words like, um, Dale palante boricua, things like that are being brought up in the dialogue and tutorialization of the game, which I thought was really cool. Another example here that I have is of a game by a studio called Raindrop Games. Um, and this is an indigenous game, so I am very interested in Taino culture and ways that we can figure out how to digitize Taino culture and use interactive media to bring global awareness to the tribes and that are currently actually in Puerto Rico. And Raindrop Studios made a, a game called Arrival Village Cacique. 
and you're kind of like in a in a village. It's like a resource type of game where you collect resources and you create things. You construct boyos, you construct bates, you construct different things, and you collect resources around the village. Um, and this game is a bit simpler, but it also speaks to some type of cultural artifacts in Puerto Rico. So the petroglyphs in Tibes and in um, Caguana, which are both uh, ceremonial parks in Puerto Rico, using those drawings and those petroglyphs um, and transferring them into the UI of the game is something that they wanted to do. Of course, this game is way out of scope. It's more of a long-term project, but you see some examples of the way that they were able to bring some Taino culture from Puerto Rico into the game's design um, and into the drawings and even the color schemes of the game. Uh, another example that I have here, I'm not going to play it, um, but it's somebody made, uh, is trying to replicate Puerto Rico inside Minecraft, and they're like building um, pretty realistic, uh, um, like dimension-wise, uh, constructions of San Juan, Ponce, Caguas, Cataño, like all these um, different towns, and they're constructing them inside Minecraft, and they're trying to be realistic with um, scale and placement of where the roads and trees and like the coastlines are and everything, which I thought was super interesting. Uh, and here I have from Batu Games, which I'm sure uh, Gabriel, should, Gabriel should be in there somewhere, because um, I know this game is old from like, I don't know, 2000, like mid, mid 2000, 2010s or maybe even earlier. Um, so the game Tripleteo, like making a game about making tripletas, which we we all know they're fatty and delicious, um, but it's definitely something that our country only has. Only Puerto Rico really has the real tripleta. So um, being able to share that with other people, they have no idea what that is, and they would be interested into figuring out what that may be, I think would be an awesome, was an awesome, awesome example of how we bring in food into the mix. Um, I, I am also making a cooking game in my own personal time. So I understand this idea of like, how can we create food and use cuisine as a, as a gameplay uh, mechanic and how we can use that to share our culture on a global scale. Um, so that's something to think about as well. You don't have to make a food game, but I think it's super interesting to think about very specific um, aspects of our culture that are transferable across the world. And food is definitely the one of the best examples of that. Now, the last two examples that I have are from different countries. So the Bushfire Rescue Tactics game was created by uh, a developer called Jez Kavanaugh. And he decided to make a game to fundraise um, for the Australian wildfires. So we all know the craziness that happened in Australia um, the past couple of months with like millions of acres being destroyed by these wildfires. And this developer decided to create something to sit, to have an opinion on it, to really make a commentary of like, we perhaps do not have the ability to go to Australia and we perhaps we don't have the financial means to donate. Um, but with this game, he was able to, to make a statement of that and have people help by donating to different organizations to help Australia. And in the game, you just fight fire. Um, and there's different forms of fire. And you save animals, rescue animals, and things like that, which is really a commentary on what was real life going on. And even though it was a tragedy, and even though we all felt it all across the world, he was able to do something about it that was really impactful and really positive. So I thought that was a good example of how we can take a negative situation going on on a, on a global event, right, and make it into an interactive form that people can experience and, and be able to, to validate in a different way other than just talking about it on social media. And the last example that I have, which is a few years old, by a Palestinian game developer, Rashid Abdullah, um, he created a, a mobile game called Layla in the Shadows of War. And this game is a bit sad because it touches upon um, war violence and the way that it affects families, especially children. So you play this game and it's a father trying to find his daughter. Um, and it is dark, it is sad, but it's again another um, very 
negative experience, negative world event that somebody used to really bring awareness and, and talk about. And he was able to bring this game to different conferences and conventions around the world and people played it. Um, and a lot of us game developers really felt for what was going on in Palestine and still goes on in Palestine in the Gaza Strip. Um, and it's a very simple uh, mechanics wise game. It's just a, a, a side scroller um, and you jump and you navigate. That's all you do. You don't collect anything because the subject matter is somber. So it's really about seeing what's in front of you um, and proceeding from point A to point B. Um, but I really thought it was a good example, again, about some things that we have been suffering in the island that are very raw, that are very real and that are sad but we can use them in, in, in social, in, I'm sorry, in interactive media as a means to really break it down and tell, pe tell people our story, tell people a story of the island and the real resilience of our people because that's really something that we should be proud of is the way that we are able to overcome adversity even though people may not be there to help us, we help each other. So I think that's something that we should think about. It doesn't necessarily have to be putting you know, a cookie in our game or the Puerto Rican flag or artifacts or music. It doesn't necessarily have to be that. But the whole analogy, the whole idea, the whole um, uh, thought processes and perspectives that we have as a people, we can definitely weave that into our game mechanics, into our puzzle designs, into our storytelling to really bring about some different, unique, and new perspectives in games that are definitely needed and are much appreciated when you put them out there for people to experience. So that is all that I had for you today in this small talk. Thank you for everybody who is here. I really appreciate it. So I hope you all have an awesome Global Game Jam tomorrow and this weekend. Really looking forward to all the games that you guys are going to be making. Um, and please uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm Tulatastic on all social medias platforms. So send me the links to your games. I want to see them. I'll boost them on my social media. Feel free to reach out to me if you have need like feedback on like game design mechanics and flows, even UI, UX design, like I'm here to help. And please tap into the Latinx and gaming uh, social platform as well, because we have channels in there for game design feedback, audio feedback, art feedback. We're there to help you out. So enjoy and have a good one.